it is my pleasure it is my pleasure to introduce Alice Krieger, the person behind Gentle Heron's avatar. She is a former educator and educational researcher. In Second Life, she is the head of the Virtual Ability Cross Disability Peer Support Community. She is president of the nonprofit corporation Virtual Ability Inc. that supports the work in virtual worlds. And she was last year's Thinkerer Award winner. Please welcome Gentle Heron. And before we start, I want to say that I feel really, really well supported by the EWDP crew that's here. So let's see how we do. This is all new technology. Hello, everybody. It's really nice to see everybody kind of late in the evening after a very full day at VWBPE. You can click the giver box down here on the stage to get the latest virtual ability community note card. And please discard all previous versions. This is a new one as of this month. You'll also get some landmarks and a note card about joining us for an opportunity to discuss health care as part of one of our major research projects. So now let's get started. Welcome to Sunflowers 101. Please don't panic. This is just going to be some fun. This is a simulated online course, and we're going to pretend that you're taking it here in Second Life. We're going to focus on sunflowers and learn about them from all different perspectives. At the end of this course on sunflowers, there's going to be a quiz. And I hope all the students in the audience will work hard so they can achieve top marks. You're going to want to take notes because this information is going to be on the quiz. So please open up a blank note card and type your notes to yourself there. Are you ready? You can also type up questions. And we'll get to the questions at the end of today's presentation. Everybody ready? OK, we're going to start with some basic facts. Always a good way to start a class. Sunflowers are very fast growing plants. They sometimes reach 8 to 12 feet. For those of you who are into metric, that would be 2.4 to 3.7 meters. They grow that tall in six months. The Guinness World Record tallest sunflower was 27 feet tall. That's 8.23 meters. And it was grown in Germany. Now we're going to move on to four little mini lessons about sunflowers. So everybody, please close your eyes. You're going to pretend you're blind for this portion of the class. Got it? If you're following text instead of voice, you'll notice that the screen is solid black. So it really won't matter if the people pretending to be blind are peeking. We're going to go into this art museum, and we're going to see an SL reproduction of one of my favorite paintings. I think this is a great way to start our sunflower set class. I want you to look at the cheerful, large sunflowers in the painting. Some of the stems are bent, and some of the more sturdy stems hold their flower upright. Notice the subtle shadings of the petals around the outside of the flowers. They aren't all the same shade of yellow. Don't they just seem to glow against that background? OK, let's move on to the next lesson. Please open your eyes for this lesson. This time, you're going to be deaf. And I will conduct the class in voice. So here we go. Great. I'm really glad you all understand that. Now we're going to take a little field trip. This time, I want you to please sit on your hands. You have become movement impaired, and you can't use the mouse to control your avatar. Here we are at the beginning of our field trip. It's early morning in Second Life, and the sunflower heads are facing east toward the rising sun. You can check that on your world map. 
We need to make this a quick trip, so we're going to head over to the second part of the field trip to see the sunflowers at sunset. And now we're going to head back to the classroom. Oh, wait. Someone in the class didn't make it to the second stop. I guess I'll just send a teleport right back to the classroom. Okay, now that we've returned to the classroom, you can stop sitting on your hands. You may want to type on your note card. Please pay close attention to what I'm going to tell you next, because this is also going to be on the quiz. I want you to notice that the seeds in the head of a sunflower are arranged in a set of overlapping spirals. You can see that on the slide. I don't want you to get too dizzy tracing them. And for the deaf, that was the nonsense sound that is heard by kids in the comic strip Peanuts when adults talk. Okay, so the sunflower class is over for today. Please remember to save your note card. You can use it during the quiz. It'll be an open note card quiz. You can still take notes on the note card and write up questions if you want to. So now let's get on with the real session I promised, which is titled Help I have a blind, deaf, paralyzed, disabled student in my SL class next term. So how likely are you to encounter a student with a disability in a post-secondary course? The percentage is about one out of 10 students and is increasing according to the US Department of Education. Older undergraduate students, those over age 30, are half again, 50% more likely than younger students to have a disability and veterans are more than twice as likely as non-veterans to have a disability. And those are two population segments that are increasing in enrollment in many institutions. Why should you be concerned about your course's accessibility? First, of course, there's the legal reason. In the US, Title II of the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990, that's called the ADA, the ADA requires that people with disabilities have equal access to public programs and services, which includes education. Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act ensures that programs receiving federal financial assistance do not discriminate on the basis of disability for otherwise qualified persons and that, quote unquote, reasonable accommodations are provided. Similar laws exist in other countries, but there's also a moral reason Shouldn't we as educators ensure that all students have equitable access to the information we're providing? You might also consider your own self-preservation. It's a whole lot simpler to build accessibility in from the course design phase than it would be to retrofit your entire course in the last two weeks of summer vacation leading up to the course day one after you have been notified that you have a student needing special accommodations. So what types of issues do students with disabilities have? Well, one type is issues with seeing and understanding what they see. Of course, this group includes those who are blind and visually impaired. This man uses a commercially available screen reader to access websites. This category of dis disabled students includes those with color vision difficulties, and it also includes those who can see but cannot understand what they see. Another type of disability are issues with hearing, speaking, and or understanding sounds. And this group includes students who are deaf or hard of hearing and those who cannot speak. Some people can speak but not hear. Other people can hear but not speak. And a large percentage of deaf people do not speak at all. This category also includes people who can hear and speak but are not able to properly process the meaning of what they hear. And it also includes people who are unable to speak what they intend to say. Some students have issues with movement. Students with movement issues may be paralyzed. They may be amputees. They may have spasticity 
or other neuromuscular control issues. This makes it difficult for them to operate the keyboard and the mouse that most of us use both to control our avatars and to communicate. Here on the left, you see a young woman, and this is actually the young woman who was the graphics designer that created the VAI logo. She uses a head wand to type, and she uses her foot to operate a trackball. On the right, the young man controls his avatar in Second Life with sip and puff technology, and he types using voice recognition software. Movement issues may also be due to low vision. Try clicking on just the right spot when everything on screen looks like a blur. Then there are issues with attention, comprehension, memory, or fatigue. And this is, I admit, somewhat of a catch-all category. As the largest group of students within this category, let's consider those whose special education label in K-12 was LD or learning disabled. And I mean the US definition of learning disabled, not the UK one. This population of students with learning disabilities is growing in post-secondary settings. A recent study of US high school graduates with disabilities showed that almost half of all the students who were categorized as learning disabled did go on to post-secondary schooling. Most of them entered two-year colleges, followed by vocational, business, or technical schools. Other disability categories that affect students by lowering their attention, their understanding, their memory, or their energy level include ADD, ADHD, which is attention deficit disorder, autism, TBI, traumatic brain injury, CFS, chronic fatigue syndrome, various neuromuscular diseases such as MS, multiple sclerosis, or CP, cerebral palsy. And honestly, don't all those acronyms fatigue you at this point in a long day? They do me. Okay, now how about that quiz on sunflowers? Ready? Question one, what country does the painter of the sunflower painting we first saw come from? Pause for answers. Now, Namara, don't whine. That's not a good excuse. It's not the Netherlands. It's not France. You're thinking of Van Gogh, right? We were in the Russian Surrealist Gallery at the Art Museum. And the rest of the class, Namara, just because you weren't paying attention, the rest of the class was looking at this painting by Vladimir Kush. Although I did describe the painting, sort of, it wasn't enough for you to tell that it wasn't Van Gogh's famous one. And I entirely forgot to name for you the building that we were entering. So the next question is, why is the sunflower not really a flower? Good try, ETBO. Fidget. You're focusing on the seeds, <laughs> Buffy, for its size. <laughs> oh, Mook, there was a painting. Oh, that's right. You did not hear me say that a sunflower is a false flower made of multiple tiny flowers called florets. And you can take a look there. 
The tiny ones in the center look very different than the long yellow ones toward the edge that we think of as petals. Each of the small inner flowers produces a single seed, but the outermost ray flowers are sterile. Next question. Is this a realistic photograph of sunflowers at sunset and why or why not? Oh, you're answering no, but why or why not? Because they close up, they're not facing the sun, they're facing the wrong direction. Lucerum, you're agreeing with people? Uh, Buffy's agreeing it. <laughs> Actually, the photo was taken at sundown. Contrary to popular myth, sunflowers do not always face the sun. Although the flower buds and the barely open flowers will track the sun as the earth moves through the day, the heavier, mature flowers remain facing east. You would have seen that if you'd been able to move fast enough, but you weren't because you were mobility disabled, remember? You couldn't keep up with the class on our field trip. But I failed to mention that. So the final quiz question, here's your chance, come on. The sunflower I showed you had 21 spirals in the shorter direction and 34 in the other. A very large sunflower might have 89 spirals in the shorter direction. How many would it have in the larger direction? Larger fidget. More. Well, I want a number. A number, please. That's a big number, Ambans. Lady Slipper goes with over 100. A big number. You quit listening when it seemed as if I was talking about math, didn't you? No wonder you didn't know how to figure this one out. It's a simple Fibonacci series played out on the heads of these beautiful flowers. Normal sized sunflowers do have 34 spirals in one direction and 55 in the other. Very large ones can have 89 in one direction and 144 in the other. So some of you got that kind of right. How did you do on the quiz? Epic fail. Aww. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Caroline needs to withdraw. <laughs> so how could I have helped you to do better? Can you think of some reasonable accommodations I could have offered since you were special education students? Could I have offered some accommodations to make the information accessible to all of you? Ice Guy says, draw sunflower pictures. Fidget wants me to be aware of her weaknesses. Namara says, errorless learning is a good approach. Image and audio. Ask if Fidget understands. Letty wants text. Losarum says she's just got to pay attention. Carolyn says she needs to be included, not left behind, so that she misses things. Buffy wanted the name of the artist and his country under the painting so there was more information. Losarum says audio is not that good for her. 
Oh, Letty wants text, image, and audio. Loud wants an administrative assistant. Is that assistant for you or for me? Oh, and Letty needed someone to say it. Ah, for loud. Ambans needed to hear it. Sky needed an interpreter. Lady Slipper would like real-time captioning. Ah, okay. Ice Guy doesn't get English. She needs an interpreter. Ice Guy has a story to tell. Ice Guy says when she was a kid in school, they constantly had these educational films like How Milk is Made from Cow to Grocery Store. It always had an off-camera voice, and she complained she didn't know what was being said. What was the teacher's solution? crank up the volume. So every film, all the kids in the classroom endured super loud talking, and she still couldn't understand it. This has been so much a part of her experience, and it was why she hated school. She rebelled, she refused to follow the book, and so on. She was also IQ tested at age seven, and her parents were told she was gifted. So she was a gifted deaf kid. There was no program for her. She, they didn't know what to do with her, so they put her in a special classroom arrangement, half days with other deaf kids, and then set her up with the SRA self-paced learning program. She loved it, but she went right through it, and then she wanted more. So once again, she was a bored, bright kid with nothing to learn, and she hated it until she took up reading. And Ice Guy asks if Lady Slipper can relate to not understanding. That is a true story from Ice Guy. And Lady Slipper agrees. I do want to go back up and catch. Carolyn said it'd be great if, as a teacher, I would check in with her so I knew that she understood what she needed to understand. <laughs> <laughs> Fidget says SRA was the bane of her existence it dumped her in with people not her age and she was the youngest it was in the world's words someone else used an epic fail and I think we'll go on <laughs> you guys are great What types of supports can be offered? There are three basic places that accessibility is necessary for courses that are offered in virtual environments. You need accessibility to the virtual environment, you need accessibility within the virtual environment, and you need accessibility between the virtual and the non-virtual environments. Your first step needs to be to commit to accessibility. Please mention that commitment in your course syllabus and offer to meet privately with any students who are requesting accommodations, that's to maintain their confidentiality. Make sure the course syllabus is easy to understand and detailed. Clearly spell out expectations before the course begins, and that means things like grading, material that's gonna be covered, due dates. Ensure that the syllabus, all the textbooks, and any other materials you're using are available before registration opens. If materials are going to be offered online, you want to consider the colors, the fonts, the formats, ones that are easily viewed by students with low vision or a form of colorblindness. Make sure that all students know how to reach you at your RL institution and in world. Share the avatar names of all staff and indicate when they're going to be in world. In the physical world, we're concerned about physical access, ramps, visible fire alarms, braille labeled elevators, 
wheelchair seating in classrooms, and handicapped parking stalls. In virtual worlds, we need to be sure that all students can create accounts and avatars and that they can all learn the basic avatar skills of in-world movement, communication, and using inventory. Now, once you've gotten all your students into the virtual setting, they need to be able to interact with all your course materials. Many virtual environments are populated with a plethora of items named simply object. Screen readers can't tell if the object is a chair, a doorway, or the teacher's lectern. Proper naming of virtual world environmental objects is critical to navigation by those people using text-only viewers. That would be the blind people. Although blind students can read chat, they can read IMs, they can read note cards, they can't read posters, they can't view videos. Deaf students are not going to be able to participate in voice discussions unless someone text transcribes. Non-speakers must be allowed to type their input in the virtual world, and that may require that other people quit talking while that person types so that their contribution makes sense in the conversation flow. In physical world classes, print materials can be provided in audio or braille format. Can you provide your virtual class materials in multiple formats? Sign language interpreters and CART typists are provided in physical world classrooms. These are examples of communication aids and services that can be managed for virtual classes as well. Mobility impaired students not only will have difficulty keeping up on field trips, but they may be slow typists. Some, but not all of them, will prefer voice over text input. They may have difficulty completing assignments and exams in short time frames. They might benefit from additional time to complete their work. Persons with concentration, attention, or memory issues might benefit from having someone assigned to take notes for them. These types of services are often available in physical world classrooms, and they shouldn't be difficult to implement in virtual classes. In the physical world, policies, practices, and procedures can be modified to accommodate student needs. Can you do that for your virtual world classes? Besides exams and graded assignments, what else is communicated between the virtual class and the physical world? As if all of that wasn't enough to think about, here are five even more basic questions. What is the overall purpose of your course? What methods of instruction are absolutely necessary to achieve this purpose? And why are those methods so critical? What outcomes are absolutely required of all students? Why must everyone achieve the same outcomes? What methods of assessing student outcomes are absolutely necessary? And why are those the best methods? What are acceptable levels of performance on student outcome measures? Those are tough questions, but we ought to be able to answer all of them. Where can you get help with accessibility concerns? Well, most US campuses have a disabled student's office, and they have just a ton of different names for this. While students, of course, need to be aware of this resource, many instructors don't realize it also serves them. Once your student has identified him or herself as needing accommodations, you can ask the disabled student's office for suggestions of how to make your course accessible. And since we're talking about Second Life classrooms and their access through computers, it's possible that your IT department might be able to offer some suggestions for accessibility. If the student is coming to you right out of high school, 
they will most likely still have a copy of their IEP, that's an individual education plan. That document will no longer be effect in, in effect in college, but it can offer some suggestions of what accommodations might prove useful. You certainly want to consult the National Center on Universal Design for Learning, and there's the link there. UDL, Universal Design for Learning, encourages instructors to examine the what, the how, and the why of learning, and to offer multiple means of representation, expression, and engagement. And I found a nice little wiki that is a UDL tech toolkit. I thought that was pretty cool. And the beginnings of a UDL wiki. It's not finished yet, but it has some good stuff. The Association for Higher Education and Disability, AHEAD. There's their website. They're a well-respected professional organization. Then there's the National Center on Secondary Education and Transition. And Ruby, if you want to type this, transition means changing from high school to college or high school to post-secondary. NCSET offers a list of ideas about supports and accommodations in post-secondary settings. Thank you, Ruby. The Rochester Institute of Technology has a very nice website. RIT's disability info page has comprehensive information about a bunch of different types of disabilities, characteristics of students who have those disabilities, suggested classroom practices if you have a student with those disabilities, and recommended accommodations for students with those disabilities. And Lori Vaughn has used that site. It's a good one. Virtual ability. We have a long, successful history in virtual worlds. We began in Second Life in 2007. We frequently consult with both students and instructors on ways to make particular in-world courses more accessible. You and the student can reach us at info at virtualability.org. We also offer a new resident orientation course on our main virtual ability island. It is organized using the principles of universal design and the theory of andragogy. And there's the slurl. Thank you, Letty. That landmark is in the giver box up there. Thank you, Buffy. Thank you, Letty. Many class cohorts enter Second Life for the first time through our website portal. There's the website portal. If we know ahead of time when classes are entering, or if we're contacted by an individual student who has a particular need, we can assign mentors to assist and guide them. Thank you, Vance. Virtual Ability is happy to provide this service to the education community. And finally, the best resource, in my opinion, for assisting a student with a disability is the student, him or herself. Most of us have been using our assistive tech for a while, and we understand what works best for us. Please don't assume that what students can or cannot do with regard to participating in class has anything to do with their disability. Think of multiple ways that students may be able to participate without feeling excluded or missing instruction. Just ask us. Thank you so much for your attention to this presentation about a topic that's becoming increasingly significant on post-secondary campuses. Be sure you've clicked the giver box. The objectives for this session were to identify student accessibility issues and some potential resources for addressing them. I hope that we met these objectives through our pretend class scenario and the quiz. 
I'd like to open the floor now to comments, suggestions, stories, and questions. I'll try to read aloud the comments that come into chat in text, and I'm going to ask, answer the text questions in voice and ask our lovely transcriber, Ruby, to type my response. And if you need to use voice for your input, please let me know so that too can be transcribed. Thank you for the compliments. And yes, it, Buffy, you're right. It is definitely a team. Letty says, with the increase in online courses, some courses go online before they know how to create accessible content. Letty, that is so true, but that's just an excuse. Shouldn't they know how to make accessible content in the physical world? It's not really that different in Second Life. Sky says one of the biggest, best things about virtual world learning environments for her was the ability to learn at her own pace. I'm going to ask Sky in text because I know that she's deaf. Why was that important? Oh, MOOC? Why MOOC? Why MOOC? Sky says this isn't classroom learning, but she learned that we can keep on learning all our lives. Lots of people are agreeing with iSky. iSky says, why? Because I am not under pressure to keep up. She can ask questions and get answers when she needs them. Fidget says, keeping up is a very difficult issue for her and some folks she knows. She thanks iSky for expressing it. So how many of these accommodations will help people who do not have disabilities? All of them? Can you give some examples? Mook says for her, it was being able to join in and back off when she needed to and only use text because voice is difficult for her and basically just everything Ice Guy said. Lady Slipper says her biggest problem with classes in Second Life is, done, is those that are done totally in voice. She's left presentations and classes early because of that. Lori Vaughn says exemplary practice helps everyone. Fidget reminds us that there is no limit to ability. Some people are not aware they have difficulties learning. Buffy says, do you plan to keep up with virtual worlds and the emerging technology of virtual and augmented reality? Yes, Buffy, we certainly will. Fidget says, there's always more than one way to learn. <laughs> and Stay on your soapbox, that's fine. I have a question for you guys. Did the simulation help? Did you learn anything from Sunflowers 101 that you did not know already? Oh, it wasn't about sunflowers. Ah, Carolyn says she thought it was a good part because she felt what she needed to know. She felt frustrated. Mook learned about the shock slap of emotion that comes with being excluded. Letty says walking in someone else's shoes is always a more powerful lesson. But 
how close of a simulation was that? I didn't think that was very close of a simulation at all. Ah, Lozerum wants us to remind, be reminded about empathy. Yarn Burst is agreeing with Carolyn. Letty agrees with Lucerum. Lucerum says, we have to try to be in each other's shoes. Iskai says, one little drawback, though, is that sometimes we don't know what we need to learn. She has big gaps in her knowledge, and she's spending the rest of her life filling those gaps and expanding on the new pictures of knowledge she gets from those gaps getting filled in. Svea, nice to see you. Comment, coming from a medical environment, he can attest that all of these principles of learning apply to patient situations for all patients because they're under stress and do not have all their normal mental and emotional resources available to them. So these concepts have applicability well beyond traditional education. Thank you for saying that. Yes, fidgets, yes. Um, was this, The simulation wasn't really very close to being blind or deaf or whatever. Mook says she could feel just a little the frustration and impotence of the student. Imagine what it's really like. Buffy says she thinks it's very admirable that you've brought awareness to Second Life. I remember way back at a metonomics meeting how you complained about things such as the color of the slides and the walls. And Ruby, I'm going to say something now. I guess I was, from attending some of the sessions before, I was thinking about some of the things that the presenters said about the accuracy of simulations in Second Life. And I didn't think that this was a very accurate simulation, but I, I, I'm gathering, gathering that it was adequate. And I'm wondering why you felt it was adequate. Svea says some of us are still color confused and still complain. Lori Vaughn says the attitude of the teacher. Come on, catch up. Let me talk louder. And loud thinks it might be the outcome. Fidget says it was adequate because it gave a glimpse. And a glimpse is necessary to be aware that there is something else out there and available. So this was for the awareness level. If you think about the objectives that were set for this lesson, that was definitely the awareness level. Object lessons, you get put into the shoes of the ones who face those challenges all the time. So Ruby, here I go again. At the very beginning of Sunflower 101, I gave you some information about sunflowers, about the size of sunflowers. What did you do with that information? Why did you forget it, you fidget? Why did you forget? Ooh, Mook remembered, 8 to 12 feet. Ice Guy says, when Gentle asked those questions, she had a near flashback to her days in school and her frequent, how was I supposed to know that? Because so frequently, that would be the sort of information she had missed. Oh, I didn't give you time to make a note. Buffy wondered what it had to do with the session. Carolyn wrote it down. She's, she's the gunner student. Lady Slipper remembered the wrong details. What kind of students would be like that? 
What kind of students would be like Lady Slipper? Remembering the wrong details. Yep, Carolyn was the teacher's pet. Ambrose doodled. Am Vans wasn't expecting it to be about the flowers. Letty said she needed to write it down to remember it, but it went so fast she forgets numbers quickly because they're meaningless to her. Iskai quit paying attention and read ahead or read one of her own books. What kind of students would remember the wrong details? Two very good answers. Loud, imaginative students often embroider details on what the teacher is trying to get across. And Lady Slipper says, inattentive students, of course, they're going to miss out on quite a bit. Inattentive students also miss out on links between information. So they may get the facts, but they may not comprehend because they don't understand how you, the instructor, are intending the facts to be linked. Letty says board students write when there's a huge problem with boredom, especially in high school. Ice Guy says, funny thing is when you're a kid, you don't get up and think, I'm going to learn some new things today. Yarn says, students who let their minds wander, students who doodle, will miss things. Amara says, those of us with cognitive challenges from brain injury have difficulty with processing or perseverating. And Namara, can you please explain? Ice Guy says, that's right. She'd get all those disparate bits of information, but had no idea how to put them together or why. Perseverating is focusing on one fact to the exclusion of others. And expecting her to remember it all sets her up for failure. Okay, we've got two minutes left. Last call for input. I am done. Thank you so much, everyone. This was really fun. And thank you to the expert support team. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> I just hope you had fun with the sunflowers. I tried to find sunflowers to give everybody as a present, but I couldn't find any that were transferable. Thank you for coming, everyone. <laughs> I suppose not, Namara. <laughs> oh, you never know what you're going to learn about from Gentle. <laughs> I actually didn't know all those things about sunflowers. I had to research them real quick last night. <laughs> <laughs>